And so we can look to Him. So, but Jesus, in that relationship with Jesus, we have to understand and realize that He meets our greatest needs. So, what are our greatest needs? Number one is forgiveness. We have a need for forgiveness. Why is it such a great need? It's because if Jesus Christ did not forgive us, where would we be? We'd be on a one-way ticket to hell. But Jesus, in His infinite love, because He died for us, He took the punishment upon Himself, and such He can forgive us our sins. We need His forgiveness. If we think about one of our greatest needs that we have, this is it. We could not have eternal life in heaven without this. And His forgiveness is so important that as we recognize how much He forgives us, that we also need to forgive others. This is important in our relationship. We need to know that there is a selfless love. We need to know that there is a selfless love for us. We need to know that we are loved. And we are loved by God. That the creator of the universe loves you immensely. If we don't know that, if we don't understand that, if we don't grasp that to some effect, where do you think that we'll go for that love? Where would we go? Anywhere and everywhere. Anywhere and everywhere. To everyone. You know, we'll go to other people and we'll say, no, you are the one. I need your love. And we'll have other people as idols in our lives. We'll look to dogs or cats, even. We'll look to sports. We'll look to food. Food. Because food's always there when you want it. You know, it gives you comfort. It gives you peace. It gives you joy. It's a good thing I don't need Rita's, but I only want it. <laughs> we need a ransom from sin. We need to know that Jesus paid that ransom, that we are no longer slaves to sin. We need to know this. We need to know that we've been rescued from sin and guilt. So many people go through life feeling guilt, feeling shame for sin, for past sin, for even sins that's been done to them and being a victim of sin. And so many people go around with this burden of this guilt and this shame upon them. And we all need to know, and they need to know as well, that that sin and guilt has been paid for. The shame in our lives has been paid for. Jesus took that upon himself. And he's given us a new identity. And that new identity is not about our works or our actions. It's not about what other people have done to us. Our identity, who we are, based upon the work of Jesus Christ and not our own works. We need to know this because then we experience a freedom. Freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom from being slaves to sin. And if we're free from that and those things, then we are free to love. See, one of the things as a uh, people pleaser that People pleasers have a tendency to be very, very nice, very kind to people, to do things that they want, to have a difficult time saying no. And the reason being is because, well, they want to be liked. But what happens in the process is this, is that people become being used. I am using you so that I can be glorified. I am using you so that I can be well liked, so that my spirits can be lifted high. but then can we really love other people? Can we love someone else if 
my purpose for contact with you is so that I can be lifted up and I can be lifted higher. Well, the reason that I'm loving you and doing things for you is because I'm doing it for me. I'm really not doing it for you and what's better for you. And so when we are freed from sin, when we are freed from guilt, when we are freed from shame, when we are freed from people pleasing, when we are freed from those things, we are free to love. I can love you with the pure love. I can love you uh, because before I would have used you. You know, I can love you. We're free to love. And we don't have those entanglements when we find our identity and our worth through Jesus Christ. That's our identity and worth. Are you defined by your actions? Are you defined by your success or failures? Is this where we get our worth? Or do we get our worth through God's opinion of us, not other people's opinions, but God's opinions? Do we get our worth through Jesus Christ's success for us on the cross as opposed to our own failures? Where is our identity and worth found? And it has to be found in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, in relationship with Him, He meets our greatest needs. Because of him, we have hope for eternal life. So we look at, and when we talk with people, and these are truths that we also need to know, we also need to recognize too, that we need him every way, every day, all of that. Paul says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And we see a little bit of that power. We see that wisdom of God that says, no, Jesus Christ has set you free. And if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. I could break out of this song. You, the Son, I did. Um, <laughs> But this is where we appeal to the heart. We focus on the cross. And we focus on Christ. So let's look at some case studies. So if you have your Bibles, let's open up those that word, word of God here. And we're going to look at how Scripture, um, the stories of Scriptures that used to appeal to the hearts of people. The first one is the woman at the well. And how did Jesus appeal to the woman at the well? How did he appeal to her heart? And what was their greatest need? So that's the question. What is the person's greatest need? So whoever has that, 4 to 20, go ahead and read it out loud. Who wants to read it out loud? Oh. All right, go ahead. Now, he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. 
Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. All right. Thank you, Neil. So when we hear that passage, or when reading alongside that passage, what do you think was this person's need? First, what was their physical need? Water. water. All right. They're at the well. She was at the well getting water. What was her what was her real need? The living water, absolutely. And so she she desired the physical. But what Jesus wanted to give her was the spiritual. What Jesus wanted to give her was himself. And so he saw something in her heart. Now he's Jesus, he can do that. It takes us a little while longer, okay? But he saw something, and we get a glimpse as to the things that he saw. And so he said that, uh, what he said, go bring your bring your husband. Well, I don't have any. Uh, he's like, well, no, you're right, but you've been married what, five times. The person that you're living with is not. So you get a kind of glimpse of what's going on there. And in that glimpse, you get the, the idea that there's a good chance that this woman was finding her self-worth, her identity, who she was in relationships with men. That this is something that fills her, that completes her. And so she's had all of these different relationships. And so she's coming to the well for some water. Jesus sees this, and he likens it to this, that she has to come back every day, every day to try to meet this need, but what she really needs is a deeper need met. She not only needs water, but she needs the living water. She needs that relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is what how he's appealing to her heart by using this illustration of what she's involved with in the moment, which is water, and he's bringing that then to himself and saying, but I am the living water. And so, no, you don't need to, you don't need a man to complete you, you need me. And I know it's so romantic that we see the TV, the movies and say, you complete me. Jesus Christ completes us. And it's in that relationship. So we see, this is how Jesus appealed to the heart. He saw what she was doing physically and led, drew her to himself. So let's look at the next passage there. Matthew 9, verses 1 through 8. Matthew 9, verses 1 to 8. Go for it. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought him to a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, take your mat, and go home. And the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God, who had given such authority to them. Great. Thank you so much. So here are these friends bringing in this guy. And he was paralytic. What was this guy's need that you saw on the surface? be able to walk. We don't know how he got that way. We don't know if he was involved in some kind of sin, and then that happened. Or we don't know if he said, well, God must be punishing me, and so he's getting down on himself all the time. We don't know exactly what or how he got that way. But we do know this, is that he had some loving friends who cared for him very much. What was Jesus' first response to this guy? Your sins are forgiven about that for a moment. He didn't say first get up and walk. Like your real need is for a change in circumstances. You need a, 
a, to be able to walk again, and that's going to make you happy. But no, he said this, knowing the heart, of course he's still got a leg up on us, being Jesus and all, your sins are forgiven. This man had a deep desire. His life was characterized by sin, by guilt, by shame. Nobody else saw that. They only saw that he couldn't walk. So maybe they thought, okay, well, he's being punished by God. But they only saw that. They didn't see the deeper parts of the heart. Jesus did and said, your sins are forgiven. And right then and there, this guy had already experienced joy, knowing that that had happened. And so we see things oftentimes. We see the physical, we see the circumstances, but we don't know what's going on inside the heart. We're going to skip case study number three for, for time. But let's look at this last one. Case study number four. Acts 17, 22 to 29. Acts 17, 22 to 29. We'd like to read that one up there. Seven verses, that's it. Go ahead, Danny. <laughs> As soon as he gets there. I'm getting there. <laughs> what is Ray's greatest need right now? <laughs> Acts 17, 22 to 20. Yeah, I'm ready Alright, 22. Yep. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines. And one of your authors had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. From one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your, as, as some of your own poets, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. So he's speaking to uh, the Athenians. And what are the Athenians' greatest need at this point? They're a very religious people. Truth. Truth. Truth found in what? Or whom? God. And it was in Jesus Christ. And so a very religious people had all of these idols and things they worshipped and did all of that stuff, but there was one altar there, it said, to an unknown God. And so it took that situation, that circumstance, and brought them to introduce them to Christ. How is it? And they said that Jesus meets your every need was written in that passage in there too. Now, when saying that, I don't want to say, okay, well, when you have a relationship with Jesus, He's going to fit your every need as if He exists for you. He doesn't exist for you. He doesn't exist for me. He is love, and He exists. And He died for our sins, but not necessarily to, so that we can just have a go-to person and live our lives the way that we do but actually even in what he had done and dying for us and living for us, resurrecting for us, he did that because he loves us so that we can have that purpose in life, that meaning in life, that hope in life that's found 
in that relationship with Jesus Christ. While at the same time saying, yes, he does meet our deepest needs. And they are all found in Jesus Christ and in that relationship. And so when we look at Scripture and we look at appealing to the heart, we find out and discover, okay, what is it that these people need in this situation? And how does Jesus Christ in that relationship also meet their greatest need? So we appeal to the heart. We appeal to them that they might go to the Word, that they might turn to Him and say, Lord, change me. 